A few weeks ago, I had the awesome opportunity to go on the Joe Rogan Experience with comedian Joe Rogan. Joe's podcast has revolutionized the way people look at alternative media. But he's much more than a stand-up comedian and the host of one of the most popular radio shows in the world. He's also an accomplished martial arts expert and self-proclaimed open-minded skeptic. In fact, he has a new show on the Sci-Fi Network called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. Well, earlier today, Joe stopped by the RT studio in L.A. to talk to me. I first asked where the idea for his groundbreaking podcast came from. The original idea came from being on the Opie and Anthony show. Uh, the way they run their radio show is very similar to the way I do the podcast, which is really, it's just an interesting conversation. And Anthony Cumia had set up something in his basement where he has a studio, his own green screen and professional cameras. And I thought it would be kind of fun to do something like that for my house just as a goof. And we started out doing it on Ustream and uh, just to a couple hundred people at first. And then from Ustream, we eventually ported the audio to iTunes. And over the course of it's almost four years now, it's just slowly but steadily grown to where it is today. Let's talk about your new show, Joe Rogan Questions Everything, in which you tackle commonly held conspiracy theories. You go in there with a completely open mind. Um, what's the most shocking thing that you've uncovered so far? Well, the really fascinating stuff was the real stuff. The stuff like when you uh, talk to people who are involved in biology and they start talking about the, the real dangers of naturally occurring pandemic viruses. Um, uh, th that was really pretty intense stuff. And then transhumanism was probably my favorite episode because I got to talk to guys like Ray Kurzweil and talk to more uh, m like scientists and people who are involved in actual real work as opposed to people who are claiming to see Bigfoot or claiming to see UFOs or things that may or may not, might not be real. The, the really interesting stuff to me was the science stuff, the stuff where we kind of explored the, the potential for humanity and our symbiotic relationship with technology. Do you think that we'll get to a point where we can download consciousness? Well, that's what they believe. They believe that either that will happen, either the possibility of downloading consciousness, which also leads, the, the real question is, how many of those can you make? Can you make an army of you? Can we have a, a million Abby Martins out there on an island somewhere just waiting for someone to come say hi? That's possible. Um, they, they don't know. They, those, those are questions that are going to have to be answered one day as the technology arises. Sort of like the questions of cyber freedom. They, they, you know, those questions didn't exist when they wrote the Constitution because nobody had an idea that people were going to be sending naked pictures of themselves through the email and other people could just <laughs> catch it out of thin air with a router or something. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so that, those, that was my favorite part of uh, doing that show. Um, the idea was to go into these different topics, whether it's Bigfoot or ghosts or whatever, completely open-minded and just see what's up. The problem is you see the same thing almost everywhere. You see like a, really, a lot of really muddy thinking. And that's the real problem with a lot of these conspiracy theories. And it became like super evident to me while doing the show. And it turned me into a pretty hardcore skeptic. I was pretty open, I'm an open-minded skeptic, but most of the time what you're looking at, whether it's Bigfoot or UFOs, it's, you're looking at crazy people. You're looking at nonsense, most of the time. You've also been a fervent proponent of the psychedelic dimethyltryptamine, or DMT. I, I can tell you about my positive experiences that I've had with a lot of different things in life. Natural psychedelic experiences, like the use of an isolation tank, and I've, uh, me personally, I've gotten great benefit out of certain psychedelics because I think they dissolve ego and I think they offer you a view of the world that may not be possible without it. They also might be the root of all religious experiences or at least most true religious experiences. In fact, mainstream scholars in Jerusalem are now trying to connect the idea of Moses and the burning bush with some sort of a psychedelic experience very possibly DMT itself because of the fact that one of the bushes that exists in, in that area is the acacia bush, which is rich in DMT, a lot of plants. There's uh, many, many plants that, that contain DMT in it, including the human mind. The human mind produces it. The body produces it. It's produced in your liver. It's produced in your lungs. And they've even shown recently in tests with live rats that they are actually producing pineal, the pineal gland itself is actually producing dimethyltryptamine. And that is what they've always th thought of as the third eye. The pineal gland is this thing that sits right in the middle of your, your head and uh, literally is your third eye. And certain reptiles, it actually has a retina and a lens. 
Why do you think and that our this, body produces it? We don't know. I mean, it, it, we need to research it. We need to find out. There's a lot of theories about it, which range from completely fantastical to, you know, the idea that it's just a, a part of normal human neurotransmitters and normal human neurochemistry, and that when you take a large dose of it, you just get this scrambled, crazy signal that you can misinterpret for being a conversation with God. Mm. You know, the, the actual, the people who believe it's an actual mystical experience believe that what it may very well be is a chemical gateway and that there is another world beside the, the material world that we exist in and that there is more than one way to, to experience this type of transcendent uh, consciousness experience. And that there's, you know, psychedelic mushrooms and dimethyltryptamine and peyote and there's a, a bunch of different ways to somehow or another pass this, this rigid dimension that we exist in and experience something that's close by. And the, the detractors would tell you, no, you're just being delusional, you're just, you're hallucinating, these experiences are not real. That may or may not be true, but my point of view has always been whether or not you are actually going to a different dimension and experiencing intense love and beauty and complete lack of ego and an understanding of reality that wouldn't be possible without that experience. Whether or not it's a hallucination or not, it is the exact same experience. So if you are actually going to another dimension and communicating with God or whether you think you are because you're taking this psychedelic drug, the experience is indistinguishable to you. I mean, and even Terence McKenna's work uh, through an anthropological lens talking about the origin of human evolution linked with psilocybin. And so there's just such a, a vast history that's kind of taboo to talk about, of course, because psychedelics are illegal. Um, they're a very taboo source of dialogue in, in our society today. And you've also said that yeah. you don't follow any organized religion, Joe, but it seems like you're a very sp spiritual person. What does the concept of God mean to you? Well, I don't, you know, it's a weird word. It gets, it gets thrown about by so many different people that have so many different ideas attached to it, whether it's Christianity or Islam or Judaism or Mormonism. What, what it means to me, the, just the idea, if, if you erase all religion, erase all ideologies, what's, is there a path that people can live that is the most harmonious with nature and with each other? Is there a path? Is there a path of, of love and of understanding and friendship and kindness? In, is there a way to reach that like universally as, as, as a group, uh, as, a, as a race, as the human race? That path would be the path of God. You know, if uh, the idea of God meaning a guy in the clouds is this one dude who runs over everything, this patriarchal figure, th that's most likely nonsense. And but what I've seen taking psychedelic drugs is so crazy that it's way crazier than the idea of a guy in the clouds <laughs> with a harp. The guy in the clouds with a harp is nothing compared to what you'd see on a heavy mushroom trip. I think that we all know that there are is a, a, a really a beneficial and a, a, a beautiful way to live life and we all know that there's an absolutely evil way to live life and it almost entirely depends on how your actions and reactions affect people around you. One human family working symbiotically with each other to make the world a better place. Joe, we have two Yeah, paths. it sounds like nonsense because you can't <laughs> control resources, how are you going to make money, how are you going to control the stock market. You know, it's very really difficult to live this beautiful life that we live in Los Angeles. You look behind, you see all these cool buildings. Those don't get made if everybody's a hippie, and that's that's part of the problem. <laughs> if you wanna if you wanna ride the high speed rail and drive a nice car, wow, you know you're you're a part of this crazy gangster system. But I think there's also a way to make things sustainable in the long run, and I think that that's what's lacking a lot is kind of the short sightedness in terms of building and technology and a lot of the advances that we do have the ability to make. Uh, Joe, let's talk about the war on drugs. Here we are, we're talking about isolation tanks, which you've said, uh, you know, can facilitate these mind-blowing experiences, similar to psychedelics. You know, speaking of all the drugs that are legal versus illegal, really shocking, 50% of federal inmates right now are incarcerated for drug-related charges, yet drug abuse in the country is at an all-time high. Why has the war on drugs been such an abysmal failure? Well, it's, first of all, it's not really a war on drugs. It's a war on some drugs. And the drugs that are government sanctioned and uh, they're, they're taxing them, those are not illegal. There's alcohol is available almost everywhere you look. And it's one of the worst drugs we have. As far as the consequences of using it, 
it's one of the most screwed up drugs available to people, and it's everywhere. We just sort of understand that one shot of Jack Daniels has this effect, one beer has that effect, and it's because of the fact that it's pretty strictly regulated, where, and it's part of our culture and has been for a long time. We've just accepted the fact that this drug is at every restaurant you go to, is at every supermarket you go to, is in drug stores, it's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's amazing, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with alcohol, don't get me wrong, I'm 100% I'm mm -hmm. down with you being able to do whatever you want to do with your body, but we're incredibly inconsistent. The, the amount of prescription drugs that are prescribed in this country points to that. The uh, amount of people in this country that are hooked on meth, the amount of people in this country that are hooked on pharmaceutical drugs, these are huge, huge numbers. And then there's drugs like marijuana, which literally hurt almost no one. And my point of view has always been, if marijuana turns your life into a loser, it's just because marijuana got there first. Like, you really had issues. If pot is what does you in, I mean, it could have been anything. It could have been gambling, cheeseburgers, scratch tickets, masturbation. You, you're, you might just be a crazy person. I don't really believe that marijuana is a bad thing. I think marijuana is a tool, and it can be used like any other tool, like a hammer. You could build a house with it, or you can hit yourself in the privates if you're crazy. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. And it doesn't mean that we should get rid of hammers. And it doesn't mean we should get rid of pot either. I think for a lot of people, pot is incredibly beneficial. It's incredibly beneficial medically. It's incredibly beneficial for people's personalities. It helps them relax and unwind and be a little bit more sensitive and be a little kinder to each other. It makes sex feel better. It makes food taste better. It's an incredible plant. It's an alien plant. It's not unlike any other plant that exists on this planet as far as the amount of good that you get from one thing. You can make buildings with it. The food, you can make food out of it. It's hemp seed. The hemp seed has amino acids in it, incredibly healthy for you. It's high in protein. I mean, it's amazing the different things that marijuana is capable of. Joe, I wanted to move on to your involvement in mixed martial arts and the UFC. I can't help but think back to the gladiator days at the Coliseum. I mean, do you think that there's something innate in human nature that makes us want to watch humans beat the crap out of each other? <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if, you know, the, the idea that one day we will be in our version of the end of the Roman Empire, and that if that was the case, wouldn't this be the, the, the rise in the most popular thing that, uh, that people enjoy, watching people slug it out? But I think the reality is all sports are about competition. It's about people trying to dominate over someone who's like them and to make it the most fair you get people down to the same weight class you you have them follow the same set of rules you give them the same equipment and the drama behind martial arts competition is something primal it's it knows no boundaries culturally it transcends everything there's certain sports that like we won't accept in america i mean popular soccer has gotten more popular it's certainly more popular than it was when i was a kid but it's still most of america does not care when the world cup is on most of america doesn't follow formula one racing good luck trying to reintroduce it to this country i i don't see it happening but fighting transcends cultures. It doesn't matter if you like cricket or you like soccer or if you like watching football. People enjoy fights and they can understand what's happening. If a ball crosses a line, it only means something to you culturally. But if somebody punches you in the face, it means something <laughs> everywhere in the world. Joe Rogan, awesome to have you on. Host of the Joe Rogan Experience. Amazing. Thank you very much. Always good talking to you, Abby. A few weeks ago, I had the awesome opportunity to go on the Joe Rogan Experience with comedian Joe Rogan. Joe's podcast has revolutionized the way people look at alternative media. But he's much more than a stand-up comedian and the host of one of the most popular radio shows in the world. He's also an accomplished martial arts expert and self-proclaimed open-minded skeptic. In fact, he has a new show on the Sci-Fi Network called Joe Rogan Questions Everything. Well, earlier today, Joe stopped by the RT studio in L.A. to talk to me. I first asked where the idea for his groundbreaking podcast came from. The original idea came from being on the Opie and Anthony show. Uh, the way they run their radio show is very similar to the way I do the podcast, which is really, it's just an interesting conversation. And Anthony Cumia had set up something in his basement where he has a studio, his own green... ...and questions everything, in which you tackle commonly held conspiracy theories. You go in there with a completely open mind. Um, what's the most shocking thing that you've uncovered so far? 
Well, the really fascinating stuff was the real stuff. The stuff like when you uh, talk to people who are involved in biology and they start talking about the, the real dangers of naturally occurring pandemic viruses um, uh, that screen and professional cameras. And I thought it would be kind of fun to do something like that for my house just as a goof. And we started out doing it on Ustream and uh, just to a couple hundred people at first. And then from Ustream, we eventually ported the audio to iTunes. And over the course of it's almost four years now, it's just slowly but steadily grown to where it is today. Let's talk about your new show, Joe Rogan. That was really pretty intense stuff. And then Transhumanism was probably my favorite episode because I got to talk to guys like Ray Kurzweil and talk to more uh, like scientists and people who are involved in actual real work as opposed to people who are claiming to see Bigfoot or claiming to see UFOs or things that may or may not, might not be real. The, the really interesting stuff to me was the science stuff.